So welcome to the live part of the MariaDB server cloud manifest today. We have a, a panel here and it's the only live section of our server fest, server manifest. And that means it's going to be quite exciting for both the panelists and, and me. And it's also an opportunity for you to ask questions live. So the purpose of this panel is to be educational, fun, and informative. Um, and this also means that it's more developer-oriented than, than being specifically marketing-oriented or, or such. But we do touch on, on also business and tech issues. So I'm your host, the moderator. I'm the CEO of MariaDB Foundation. My name is Kai Ardne, and I will be asking very simple questions halfway technical, halfway business. And I will now present the other pa panelists, probably in a bit of a rude order, starting from, from ourselves at the MariaDB Foundation. First, we have uh, Daniel Black. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Thank you Daniel, for joining. Uh, Daniel is the, our Chief Innovation Officer from the MariaDB Foundation and, and calling in from Australia. So this is in the middle of the Canberra night, whereas I have sunshine in, in, in Finland here. And he's representing primarily the user base of MariaDB. And Daniel, as you will soon be able to tell, is more technical than myself. Then we have Rob, Rob Hedgepeth. He's leading the developer relations team at MariaDB Corporation. And he is based in the US, so for him it's early morning. And he'll primarily be representing SkySQL, and he's the only cloud provider here, so he might have to answer questions also from a general cloud perspective. So, hi, Rob. Hey, Kai. Hey, everyone. And last, but by no means least, uh, we have Steve Shaw, the open source database lead at Intel, very much a, a deep techie here, very articulate and uh, from the UK and representing the hardware provider perspective for this for uh, because Intel's customers are cloud service providers. So welcome, Steve. And this also makes me the only non-native speaker. So it's my duty to represent the common lingua franca of IT, bad English. And as this is a live talk, talk for now, you won't even have subtitles, so I will have to do my best. Now we'll ask questions mostly for everyone to answer, but some are obviously more for Steve, others more for Rob, Rob and others for Daniel. And we'll have it, we will be having four sections here. Hardware, mostly for Steve, but also for Daniel. Software or services uh, for Rob and also Daniel. And then, uh, shall we say, ethical uh, part about uh, free and open source software for Daniel and everyone, everybody else. And then the last section will be about uh, the user perspective of free and open source software, specifically about lock-in. So what do you lock yourself into? Do you lock yourself into software or into clouds or, or what? So going to the first section here, hardware. Um, databases were created in a different era where, where there were hard disks which worked different from persistent memory does now so so the design of databases was for a different technology than what we have have now that we have flash memory and there were different uh, reasons for having caches and the caches now are much bigger and the profile of, of query performance is quite different so so my overall question is, what does this mean for cloud databases? And what does it mean for uh, the users who have to configure them? So what's the end user perspective? And, and I was uh, thinking now that can we, can we separate this into, shall we say, CPUs and, and memory and storage, those, those uh, separately. So perhaps the, the question should go now to Steve. How, how do you see this? Uh, well, I think it's, it's a great question because I'm on the, the TPC OSS, so the Open Source Subcommittee, and a key topic in that group is the HTAP workloads, so the hybrid analytic and transactional workloads that 
previously, I mean, I've been working in databases for, in fact, running databases on Intel for over two decades. You know, when systems, I think if we look, you know, even back then, like just an eight socket Pentium Pro was more than a million dollars. So the capabilities of systems was, you know, very well segmented. I think the hard drives were huge at two gigabytes. So, you know, Moore's law very much restricted, you know, the potential that you had with what you could do with the database. So now I think, you know, in the cloud era, if we look now, like eight vCPUs, you know, compared to that system that cost a million dollars, you know, would now cost cents to hire. It gives you that potential to be able to, the hardware capabilities are so much more to be able to run those different workloads. So, and I think now we're in a, an age where very much the software is, is almost catching up with the, the, the capabilities of the hardware where people are asking, well, you know, we don't have to run transactions, you know, and analytics, you know, separately now. We can share the data, you know, in the cloud and we can have multiple sort of hybrid systems. And I think that's the trend. That's the direction that, you know, databases are going in, you know, where people you know, won't be asking, you know, you know, we used to have a separate a you know, warehouse from our, trans, you know, our transactional systems. It will be the case where we just have this pool. And I think that's where the capabilities of features such as persistent memory, you know, already supported in MariaDB, you know, currently for append-only files, but you know, looking at the potential that we have for large terabyte buffers, you know, where we can have our transactional data, you know, different pools, and we can run our queries all over the same data set. So I think that's really very much where MariaDB, you know, with a column store and a transactional storage engines, you know, really fits together and very much blends with the, the hardware trends that, that we've been driving. Um, I guess there's also an aspect of, you know, it, it's not only just the, the software being ready just to, to slot into whatever hardware comes along. There's, um, some re-engineering work as, you know, rotational disks go out and some, you know, timing assumptions in the underlying code uh, need to get re-evaluated um, as the NUMA architectures actually push uh, uh, the, the core counts and the, the, the virtual CPU counts up um, and how to actually ensure there's no, you know, contention points on those because, you know, when you're got a, a really old code base that's uh, uh, around that sometimes it's some of the simple things that uh, will constantly move as to where the bottleneck actually is. Um, and I guess also on like uh, hardware devices, you know, we're getting, you know, contributions in from like ARM and power to, to get this features introduced, but we're also actually getting a, a huge increase in just the, the volume of data. And as we're getting that, you know, the, the CPU frequencies are starting to really cap off. So we're really having to, to focus on like the horizontal uh, scalability um, to actually meet those demands, not only in column store, but um, as Sadaka said, you know, about uh, getting those into parallel queries and um, other features in the database that are harder to implement. <laughs> So Robin, you view on the hardware level from, from your side. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think, you know, right, kind of going off of what Steve and Dan said, I mean, and, and Steve really mentioned it up front is this ability to, or, you know, now that we have the capabilities from a hardware perspective to, um, to be able to take advantage of both transactional or row-based and, you know, analytical and column-based at the same time is gonna be massive. And then Daniel really hit about on this idea of horizontal scaling. Um, the capabilities of hardware as they are now, uh, as Steve really, you know, has, has spoken to now, but obviously in his, his session before, um, are really are really starting to, uh, you know, rather than, you know, kind of trying to, you know, have Moore's Law basically be a blocker of some sort, you know, throughout that, we're really starting to open things up. And, um, you know, coming from an application development, you know, background, um, that's something that, you know, and Steve had hit on just a little bit before is, you know, why should I have to, you know, use analytics or large amounts of data um, separately um, from my transactional workloads? And anymore, you know, applications, whether it's mobile or IoT, 
um, you know, some of these things that we may even get into in edge computing, um, you know, they, they have higher, you know, higher expectations than ever before. Um, it's not anymore that we'll just stick out a, you know, web application that's just simply, you know, running CRUD types of operations. We need to see, you know, real insights into data, uh, massive amounts of, you know, maybe historical or analytical information in real time. And I really think that, you know, modern hard hardware has, has really helped uh, facilitate that. My layman's view on, on hardware. <laughs> Thanks, yes, very good. So, so let's now move to, to the software part. And I have a couple of question, questions here, but I'll, I'll sort of ask all of them at the same point in time. And, and then you, you can give your view on, on all of them at, at the same time. And probably this will be giving you, uh, Rob, the word first, and then, uh, then Daniel and then Steve. So I'm thinking about the marriage of a database to, or one database to one cloud provider. And I'm thinking there's, there's advantages to it, sort of hard coding, the best characteristics of a database to, to the best characteristic of, of that particular cloud provider. So if you do deep integration, isn't that an advantage? That's sort of a, an advantage point, a st good starting point of it. But then uh, there's the other side of it. So, uh, or, or that would imply that the level of integration cannot be as deep in something like Sky SQL, which is uh, a layer between the, the, the software and the, the cloud provider as I understand it. And you might then also, Rob, have an opinion on whether you view Sky SQL as a cloud provider in that sense or, or a layer for several clouds. And, and then looking at the content now of a cloud version of a database, and we now have Sky SQL represented here. So what I understand from your presentation and, and reading up uh, on, on stuff, so is that Sky SQL is sort of the same as uh, MariaDB Enterprise and sort of something more. So it does contain products that are not part of the server, such as uh, max scale for, for load balancing and other things, and, and expand for this um, well, truly different way of, of getting uh, uh, right scalability. And as I get it, you have other, you could at least uh, have other features that are server specific that exist only in, in Sky SQL, but not in in MariaDB Enterprise. So, so perhaps you have at this point some, some comments on whether I, I did understand this Sky SQL concept uh, correctly or not, Rob. Yeah, Kai, and that's, there's a lot to unpack there, right? From, you know, this idea of um, vendor lock-in, you know, kind of, you know, proceeding now, uh, you know, what would have been software lock-in before, and then, you know, talking about how you can take advantage of, of you know, some of the cloud provider specific functionality. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, my thoughts on this are, you know, one, and I, I you know, I spoke to it a little bit inside of my session where, you know, I talked about the architecture of Sky SQL. And I think Steve even spoke a little bit of, um, you know, diving into hardware capabilities and stuff like that. But one of the things that, you know, we, we set forward to do was to create a, um, you know, a, a something that was not necessarily, you know, specific to a particular cloud, and that's by design, um, where we utilized, you know, the, the capabilities of Kubernetes. And, you know, for a lot of people out there, they've probably at least heard um, the word Kubernetes. And, you know, we've been able to utilize some of the, you know, some of the features and some of the, the advantages of something like an orchestration engine um, like Kubernetes, um, without getting into too many of the details, um, you know, some, some of the things where they key in on, you know, cloud native technology, where, you know, we have the ability to, you know, create, you know, MariaDB as, as a service, as you had indicated, um, as something that is, a, you know, truly cloud native, you know, then utilizing Kubernetes to take advantage of, you know, some of the self-healing capabilities, and then be able to combine that um, with, you know, other things that you mentioned, kind of like bringing all the, all the questions and, and what you asked about before. But, you know, as you'd mentioned, you know, MariaDB Sky SQL includes things like MaxScale right off the bat, right? Which is, um, for those that may not necessarily be aware, uh, it is a database proxy, like to put it so simply, um, you know, we'll, you know, do some things from a security aspect. It'll handle um, things like rewrite splitting, query routing, stuff of that nature, as well as, you know, things like HA capabilities. And then combining that with Kubernetes um, creates this extremely resilient um, version or form of MariaDB Enterprise Server uh, on the cloud. 
Um, from a, a lock-in, you know, standpoint, um, certainly, you know, there are, there, there's going to be pros and cons to that. Um, some of the pros, uh, obviously, is that, you know, with being able to use MariaDB in, currently in GCP or Google Cloud, as well as AWS, and then we're going to be providing, you know, Azure soon, we're actively working on that. Um, you know, you have this uh ability obviously to use MariaD like you'd expect. So either on, you know, how you'd use it on premises or use it in the cloud. But, you know, some of the things from a, a cloud provider perspective that, that's interesting is that they provide a lot of services, right? They may have, um, you know, some analytical or business intelligence uh, applications that you can run, you know, from a cloud native perspective um, that would tie in. And, you know, some of the things that makes it really nice, you know, having MariaDB inside of these different cloud providers, um, you know, from an enterprise perspective is that, you know, we can set up things like virtual private links so that you don't have to leave the cloud, you know, in a cloud provider and then come back into MariaDB. You can, you know, act as, as though it's internally communicating with it. And those are things that, you know, help from inside of a cloud provider for sure. Um, was there anything else that I didn't necessarily um, kind of key in on? I think, I think you had asked about, you know, some of the other capabilities like max scale, um, as well as expand, um, where, sorry, guy. Yeah, I, I think uh, you answered it, but, but, but I, I think Daniel might also want to expand yeah. on some of the things. That we'll yeah, um, I, I mean, you've obviously deployed to like two and I'll say two and a half um, cloud providers, and you've, in your talk, you really described um, Kubernetes as, you know, this super standard approach to doing it. And, and it sort of is, it sort of delivers a lot. But um, as you I get going between those two, the, there's obviously subtle differences. So how standard is it once you get down into the lower levels of trying to implement it across three different uh, uh, clouds? Yeah, and I'll try to speak to that, I guess, a little bit is, is obviously I work more on the developer relations side and not, you know, directly within the, you know, the cloud or the, sorry, the, the you know, the cloud providers and the Sky sure. SQL team. But uh, to your point, um, and, and really something that Kai mentioned before in this idea of vendor lock-in is, or, you know, with cloud provider lock-in is a lot of these cloud providers provide very similar services. And one of those is Kubernetes True. services where utilizing Kubernetes and essentially the Kubernetes API um, you can help eliminate work. Now, to your point, Daniel, that's not, you know, going to be something that's ex exactly the same, you know, from Azure to AWS to GCP. So there is specific things that, you're, you know, that we would have to do as an engineering team to, to make, you know, Kubernetes work and, and function the, the um, well within that particular and that kind of thing. Ex exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's something that we can certainly get in, you know, from a, from a cloud native perspective, the ability to tie into, um, you know, block storage and then object storage, um, those, you know, those different, uh, you know, different options that may exist in the different clouds um, from a high level are, are simply just named differently, of course, as you get deeper and deeper into that, of course, the integrations become a little bit more specific, of course, to the cloud providers themselves. So I have a, a specific question, I think, for for you, Rob, later, but I'll first ask Steve, what's, what's your take on this? I think there's many different aspects of, you know, sort of lock in on, on the software, you know, and, and on the, the hardware side, you know, and I've spent a good deal of my career, you know, helping customers move away from proprietary systems, you know, over to industry standard based systems based on Intel, you know, Linux, you know, and open source software. I think some of the, firstly, one of the key aspects is, I think as we saw in my presentation, that ability, you know, to lift and shift. That gives you that peace of mind, you know, on both the hardware and the software side. If you can take your solution and you have that option to lift and shift, you know, between clouds, you know, but even on premise, you know, if you wish, then that's an important checkpoint, if you like, that shows that, you're not completely locked into a, a particular solution. Also, another aspect that I would say, you know, as an open source developer, you know, I'm the author of the, the HammerDB tool. You know, one thing that I find particularly important as a developer is that ability to you know, be able to run MariaDB on a laptop, develop my software you know, on a laptop, exactly the same architecture, and then deploy exactly the same you know, on-premise or into the cloud, you know, test on virtualization. You know, that's what gives us the flexibility 
you know, and that ability, I think, overall, you know, to to innovate. So, and, and I think that's the ability that that non-proprietary solution. You know, we've been we've moved away from that period of proprietary lock-in. So it's that ability to, I say, just have that flexibility, develop, and then be able to move your solution from one place to another. That really is key. Great, thanks, thanks, Steve, and, and I think that speaks to your term of, of work from literally working from home as well. So, so the, the, the question I have for you, Rob, is, is leading into the area area of topic of ethics, where, where I have a, shall we say, the foundation standpoint and thinking on, on clouds, but I'll ask a, an innocent question. So how does, in your mind, the uh, MariaDB, uh, being run in the cloud so much affect the development of MariaDB server itself. And, and when we in the MariaDB Foundation talk about MariaDB server, in, in your language at the corporation, you might call it MariaDB community server. But sort of the thing that you get from, from Docker, from, from downloads, and, and from the Linux distributions, if, if, if you take it off the box. So what does cloud mean for the development in the future like after 10.6 in your mind? Yeah, I mean, in, you know, kind of putting on my developer hat, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, kind of, and hopefully I'm, you know, approaching this question correctly is, you know, from, from a de developer standpoint in the cloud, uh, and Steve really talked about this too, right, is this ability, you know, you had mentioned it, Kai, and, you know, maybe we call it community server, or we'll just call it MariaDB server, and this, you know, how you can develop it on your, and I think every developer would start this way, you know, whether you're using a container or Docker container, or whether you're using a local version, um, the ability to, to use MariaDB and MariaDB features, right, and set up the architecture, or the, the pluggable storage engines in the way that you want to, um, you know, be able to, to write that locally, and then the cloud really functions as, as a way to make that you know, easier. So kind of from the outside, right, not determining the, you know, the, what, what would be in the server kind of going forward, but from a developer standpoint, I mean, the whole purpose, right, is, is to provide a service. And it's a little bit different than, than what, you know, traditionally we've been focusing on at MariaDB, which is developing a product, right? And there's a lot of different um, you know, considerations whenever you're developing a product and you'd kind of mentioned it with the, with the community and, you know, being able to add that in. Now, with, with the cloud themselves, um, the service, there's different expectations, right? There's a, there's a lot more emphasis on simpl simplicity um, and usability. So being able to very simply be able to stand something up, um, you know, have the appropriate amount of configuration, but also have defaults, right? So that I can just one, two, click my way into you know, into a database of some sort um, that I that I'm able to use, um, and then you know, from a from a capability standpoint, I mean, we're not currently doing anything um, different between what would be our enterprise server version and you know what's in Sky SQL. Uh, but again, that's it's a service that you know is deployed out to the cloud, and it could be possible um, that we could have you know, different functionality or extended functionality within Sky SQL as a service that, that would possibly make it easier um, for, you know, as we talk about the emphasis on developers, easier or simpler for them to be able to, to use certain features. Um, that's something that is certainly, uh, you know, possible within, you know, providing a service as opposed to, you know, as Steve had mentioned, kind of having to set up everything from a product perspective on your machine and, you know, be able to indicate all that stuff. Um, you can just, you know, do that through an interface or, you know, we're currently working on APIs, de deploying APIs so that you don't even have to go to an interface to work with Sky SQL. You can just, you know, from a developer operation standpoint, just use an, an API essentially to do that. And, and that's something that's a little bit different than if you're working with a product for sure. Cool, yes, so, so I think this goes back to, in a way it goes back to the roots of, of ease of use. I, I remember, uh, uh, a certain ancestor product of MariaDB, uh, there was the 15 minute rule of setting up uh, MySQL in, uh, back in, in, in those days when MySQL was new. I think you're speaking to the very same need. It needs to be very simple to set stiff stuff up and the defaults need to be good. And, and the underlying logic is the same in the cloud, but the world, uh, the, technological, uh, the technology is different. So, so it's a different incarnation of the same thing. So now for the political uh, question. So, um, and this is, uh, this is asking stuff from a MariaDB Foundation perspective. 
The MariaDB Foundation is about the adoption of MariaDB and the openness of the development and about the continuity of, of the product in all, all possible scenarios of the world. And, and uh, we think about the cloud in a, in a specific way, which might differ from the way that, that others are, are looking at it, like how, how things should work. So cloud is good. To, from our perspective, uh, deploying MariaDB in the cloud is deploying MariaDB, so it's adopted more, so it's basically good. However, it differs a bit from like Docker or, or downloading stuff or, or getting MariaDB of a, a Linux distribution because the, the, the cloud providers themselves extract a considerable uh, commercial value out of the software development that, that, that goes into MariaDB server. And, and here, I think the situation is not very symmetric between all, all the different cloud, cloud providers because uh, you, Rob, represent MariaDB Corporation who, who puts in more than the fair share of, of the development of the uh, open source uh, bits of, of, of MariaDB. So uh, our thinking is, and this is not putting percentages or numbers or, or, or anything into it, but our thinking at the foundation is that there should be a, a, a shall we say, correlation. There should be a, a the contribution back to the ecosystem by a cloud service provider should reflect the fact that the cloud ser service provider also extracts some uh, considerable economic benefit out of the, the software. So, so without going into any more specifics than that, what's your thinking, what's your feeling about this, shall we say, ethical aspect? And I'll give you, Rob, uh, the first uh, word here. Yeah, and that's uh, that. It, it, that's something I think that we could have a completely different panel um, just on this subject matter. At least in my opinion, um, obviously, as you kind of hinted, um, you know, and for those of you that may not necessarily know, um, what Kai's you know describing is you know the fact that MariaDB is open source and you can you know bring that in into say a cloud provider and you know without using specific examples be able to provide you know MariaDB server as uh, a, a managed service in the cloud themselves, and then you know contribute a very a, what I would consider a nominal amount um, compared to the millions or hundreds of millions of dollars that they possibly could make off of MariaDB. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I I fully agree with you. Now, obviously, I come from a fairly different position where you know MariaDB Corporation is, I mean, making no bones about it, trying to make money, um, <laughs> you know, trying to keep the lights on. Um, and, you know, we obviously, you know, provide quite a bit of contribution into the open source solution and then with enterprise bits, you know, trying to, you know, create a, a little bit more hardened or enterprise, you know, ready solution. Um, <clears throat> but we're trying to, you know, be able to essentially, you know, uh, you know, make money off of that. And it, ma it makes it difficult um, with some of these cloud providers that yeah, certainly MariaDB is a great product. MariaDB server um, or community server, as you mentioned before, is a fantastic product. It is, um, it has a ton of capabilities, you know, it can work for a variety of different workloads. Um, and if, I think if, you know, we could get, you know, a little bit more contribution, or as you said, more symmetrical um, contribution from those that are making money off of it in, in these, I think that that, that only makes sense. Um, I, I also think that it's not something that people readily think about. I think that, you know, when I talk to, you know, friends of mine, developer friends of mine, and they go and use MariaDB um, directly from a cloud provider, I think their assumption is, is that, you know, that MariaDB, you know, foundation or corporation helps to maintain those. And, you know, they obviously they, you know, they help to uh, provide those within those cloud providers, uh, but which isn't necessarily the case. And I think that a little bit of that is probably just raising awareness to that, um, not necessarily in such a negative way, but to kind of help you know, maybe promote um, this idea, like you had mentioned, of, of contributing more um, to MariaDB and, you know, the open source solution and, and being able to, you know, especially some of these cloud providers like, you know, Amazon, uh, Azure, GCP, they've got some wicked smart developers that we would love to have, you know, more contributions from them, for sure. Thanks, Rob. So, so what does this look like, Steve, from your perspective I, I expect that Daniel won't say very much different things from 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 what I said but but Steve what's your take 
Well, yes, as a, an open source developer, you know, directly as said, so as the author of HammerDB, which is a benchmarking tool, you can use the test MariaDB. Uh, one of the origins of that, you know, came from the fact that we had, you know, restrictions sometimes in software licensing that meant that aspects such as database performance, you know, just in itself was quite closed. So that's why I decided to write a tool to make it much more open, allowing you to compare and contrast, you know, di different, different platforms. So from, from my perspective as a developer, you know, I'm fortunate that Intel is a very sort of open source aware employer that allows me, you know, to develop open source at the same time as doing my regular role. But I actually, by coincidence, wrote a, a blog post directly on how to interact with the project because I had the feeling a number of you know, people didn't necessarily weren't aware of open source ethics. So a lot of people using cloud environments are are new to how to engage with projects. And I think the two key words really are, you know, give back, you know, even, and that doesn't mean you have to say, well, I can't write the code, so there's nothing I have to give. There's a lot you can give, you know, answering discussions, contributing to issues, you know, ideas, being part of the community. It's really, you know, sharing what you have, giving what you can contribute. You know, you don't have to take on, a big portion of the software development is just having that, that ability to give what you're able to give, I think is the real aspect. You know, as a developer, that's what you feel, that's where you see the value. You know, if it's not going to be monetary value, then you need that form of, you know, contribution, you know, in terms of what you can give back overall to the project to help open source grow and flourish. Also, I guess a huge big role in that into um, instilling uh, organizational culture is like, you know, th this isn't this isn't throwing away money. This isn't, um, you know, throwing away people's time. This is is making an investment in, you know, how everyone sees it and not just as oh yeah we'll throw out an open source badge and, and say we're open source it, it's got to actually be um backed up by um substantial you know behaviors around it um to actually start the the process of um being a, a contributor being able to you know go out and help stack overflow being able to um you know saying even just you know our customers and users are wanting this sort of feature um it, it, it there probably need to be a bit of mentoring in the culture side too to make it and that's part of why we have uh mariadb server uh minifest like this to 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 foster that that culture so we'll conclude this um, panel by a forward-looking technological question and uh, and that's about edge computing. And I, I'm not really sure about what edge computing is. And I'd like you to educate me about what it is and educate the, the viewer. So I, I have a question. Is edge computing the opposite of cloud computing or is it a special case of it? Uh, I view, like to put matters in a very simple form, the uh, uh, cloud is, is a modern word for a data center. It, it, it has evolved from something that already existed in the 70s and, and, and of course in its modern form. Whereas I believe that edge computing is, has evolved from something that started only with the internet, with mirrors that, that uh, developed into CDNs, content distribution networks. And then you have the opportunity of having part of the data in the form of a DB database or something else distributed in, in, in many places. And now in particular, I, I read about what, what happened this week, uh, earlier this week with lots of outages uh, in the internet, not related to databases, but big services starting from, from um, Amazon and, and uh, Guardian and, and the UK government and stuff uh, based on CDNs not, not working. So, here, I'd like to understand some basics. So is, uh, what's the relationship? What is edge computing? And how does it relate to the cloud? And perhaps, I think, 
Steve is the, the right guy to, to, to answer uh, at least first. Uh, well, I think it all it almost goes full circle back to my you know, the, to the the first answer you know, around Moore's law, you know, and the cost of computing. When I mentioned you know a couple of decades back, you know, you were looking at a million dollars plus for what would now be a very modest amount of co- compute capability. We now have instead a huge amount of you know compute capability at lower costs that can be deployed right throughout the network. You know, so I work directly with you know telcos who are your know, big users. That that's the best example you know I can think of. You know, of edge computing, big uses of open source databases. You know, to gather and process data external from that central cloud or data center. You know, essentially at the edge, and it's really I would say it's it's in many ways it's the same answer. It's Moore's law that drives you know the, the capabilities you have to be able to gather and process that data for faster response times, you know, higher levels of availability. You know, that, that's really what the advantage of edge computing gives you. But as, as also from that perspective of data centers, you know, in the 1970s, you know, there's, it's still very much a similar approach, you know, in terms of software, you know, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's at the edge, you know, we're still using the same hardware architectures, you know, we're still using the same software. We're using MariaDB on Intel, we're just applying it at different areas, aspects are parts of the network. Good, thanks. So Daniel, some concluding words now on, on, on like all of the topics we, we, we've said. Uh, on the edge computing, the yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, on the edge, it's really, you know, fascinating to see it going out and I guess MariaDB, uh, even with its MySQL origins, sort of has said like the replication um, aspect for age, ages and, yeah, the unit's growing with the synchronous, the, the multi-source, and while the edge computing is like pushing about unique aspects, the the concurrency of databases makes some of those aspects a, a little bit challenging, but on a, on a read-only provider, you've got a bit of latency pushing data out is um, making better user experience, which is um, uh, <laughs> what keeps us going. Um, all the time from all the innovations across um, all our speakers that show that the MariaDB is a good uh, foundation for, um, you know, breaking apart and doing innovative things in clouds and and stripping back layers and adapting them to various storage. So we're really, I think, very fortunate um, to be in such a lucky position as an open source project. Thanks, Daniel. And, and Rob, you don't have to say anything on Edge if you don't wish to. Uh, some concluding words on, on MariaDB and cloud from your side. Yeah, kind of going off of what you know, Steve and, and Daniel have kind of set up, I think that you know, the ability, one, obviously, for, for those that may not necessarily have much of an idea of, of Edge computing, um, and what Steve spoke to a little bit, it's it's a way to solve a couple of problems, right, where essentially, and then it kind of flowed directly into what Daniel said, which is this, you know, kind of heightened expectation. Um, You know, we have more and more types of devices, types of applications, types of solutions um, that are ultimately utilizing uh, MariaDB and edge computing will, you know, essentially for the simplest explanation, make that faster and make that more responsive. Uh, But one thing that I will say from a concluding aspect is as we've talked about, you know, various things like you know, being able to, you know, put a MariaDB in the cloud or be able to use it from a container approach. And, you know, even as we get into the different workloads that it can handle through different storage engines, I think, you know, my main takeaway is that MariaDB is constantly innovating. Um, You know, we have, you know, an awesome community out there helping contribute to this. And for those of, you know, outside of, you know, maybe even listening to this Minifest that may not necessarily understand um, you know, relational databases uh, are not old and crusty. Uh, there are uh, lots of innovations happening, um, and it, it's not just the the stake of say maybe a, a NoSQL or you know those who shall not be named. Um, you know, from from years ago, you know, MariaDB is is constantly innovating, and, and it, it's in thanks to you know thank you to the community out there. Um, it, it is 
it's eye opening to me just every every day I go into, you know, go into work or I'll go out to different project and just um, the resourcefulness and the ingenuity of our community um, is is certainly breaking down this thought barrier of uh, old and crusty. Uh, it's certainly the opposite of that. Uh, it's very exciting. And thank you very much, Kai, for having me on here. This is uh, with Steve and Daniel. It's It's been awesome. Great. So those who shall not be named, that was a good expression. We'll start, start using it. But I will instead name you, the, the three of you, uh, Steve, Rob and Daniel. And thank you very, very much for, for uh, making it to this, uh, making this panel a, quite an interesting one. And I'm looking forward to, to having more panels with you. We will take a break over, over the summer in the Northern Hemisphere here and continue with other server fests uh, when autumn, autumn comes. So thank you also to everybody who's, who's uh, lis listening and, and all the other presenters at this MariaDB server cloud manifest, but especially thanks Steve, thanks Rob and thanks Daniel. Welcome. Thank thanks, you Kat. thanks everyone. Thank you.